live from the recording, so we're starting pre Oh, I'm a prison. Yay, welcome. All right, we'll pray. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. We just pray, Holy Spirit, that you'd come tonight. You'd speak to our hearts and our minds. You'd steer the conversation. I pray that revelation um, would win out. And I pray that even as we look at facts and different things and we speculate and we uh, chew over different things, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would have your way and you'd be ultimately glorified in, um, in this session. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. This is the one I've been dreading the most. Um, <laughs> so we'll get into it without much further ado. We've been making our way through uh, the Gospels, and we've been slowly making our way through the uh, Gospel according to Mark. Um, welcome for the first time, um, uh, those that are joining us today. Um, now, uh, just as we get into it tonight, this is a helpful classroom analogy we've used in the past on um, these especially tricky subjects. Um, in our faith uh, and biblical interpretation, there's the ropes of the bridge and then there's the base of the bridge. Uh, the ropes are uh, the interpretation, the details of Mark chapter 13 uh, are not foundational pillars, or hopefully shouldn't be absolute foundational pillars of our faith. Um, and tonight, I'm probably going to tug on a few people's ropes. And if you're putting all of your weight of your faith on your interpretation of the end times, you're going to feel really thrown by tonight. So can I encourage you to take your weight off it, let go a little bit, and just focus again the weight of your faith on what really matters in your faith, your relationship with God, your faith in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. What we do know for sure about the, the New Testament theology is that there's a general belief that Jesus will return to judge the living and the dead and he will rule and reign, that his kingdom will come. There is a general belief, okay? Now the details of that have been debated for 2,000 years and we'll debate them tonight. Okay, so it's not new, this debate. But as we get into the details and we look and we examine, I just want to encourage you that uh, it's, it's okay to feel thrown, but just to re reconsider the, the base that we're standing on. Um, because unfortunately, the reason we get thrown is because in the last hundred years, there's been a lot of stuff like this in the church. This is a, a thorough presentation on hundreds of scriptures and prophecies about why 2012 is definitely the end of the world and unfortunately i don't know what this guy wrote after this book <laughs> and the world did not end but there's been a lot of this and so there's been a lot of this and that's what puts us in a predicament because unfortunately we do live in a world where we read mark 13 we read these prophecies in the bible and we can see it in our culture and we can see signs of the times and we can see things that we relate to. And in the nature of, of these kind of prophetic writings is they do leave us to our own interpretation. Um, we look out and we're like, yeah, man, it must be the end because we see this and we see that. And unfortunately, every generation's done that. Every generation since Christ has looked at the world around them and gone, we're it. <laughs> this is the end times for this reason, this reason, and this reason. So that's, that's normal, and it's normal to feel like that. But let's, let's just, you know, some of you will be really good at that, really used to just letting go and just focusing on the main, main parts of your faith, and other, other people might be shaken. Um, I've photocopied the Nicene Creed. This is a good one um, to fall back on. This is what the Council of Nicaea, all the bishops in the year 312, I think. Um, oh, do you want a whole bunch of these notes? Anna, here you go. Um, they, they agreed upon and they debated for days and days and days on what the wording should be on the foundational stuff. This is the foundational stuff here. This is the foundation that we rest upon. And uh, it says here, He ascended into heaven. He sat at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and His kingdom will have no end. And right at the end it says, I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. That is, that is basic creed christianity 
but everything else is uh, up for grabs tonight. So <laughs> let's, um, let's have a look. So last week, in the last few weeks, we've seen Jesus coming to Zion as uh, firstly a messianic king. We've seen him coming as a rebuking prophet, and we've seen him coming as Israel's teacher, the high priest. And we've seen those uh, in, in the chapters that we've been exploring. We've seen these figures of Christ as he's taken on these different personas. Tonight, we're really going to see him prophesying and acting as a prophet. <clears throat> Mark 13, the end of everything we know, the end of this age. I want to get, if you can try and wipe away just for a moment and sort of wipe the slate clean of, of other things that you've taken on the border over the years and interpretations of this verse. And if we try and start again tonight, I would encourage you to look at this chapter, Mark 13, as the end of everything we know. Everything is about to come undone in a very real way for the early church. They are going to experience this. And Jesus is preparing them. Mark 13 starts in chapter, uh, verse 1. It says, As Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to, Oh, by the way, online audience, if you have any problems, please send me a text. I've got my phone right here and I'll attend to it. Sometimes we have issues online. Jesus was leaving the temple. One of his disciples said to him, Teacher, look at the magnificent stones and buildings. Do you see all these great buildings? Jesus replied, Not one stone here will be left on another, every one will be thrown down. While Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, and John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things happen? When will what happen? When will these things? What are these things? What he just said. This is the context. When will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they, those things, are about to be fulfilled? Everything that follows in this chapter is in relation to this question that's being posed. He is answering a question. Answering a question. <clears throat> Mark has included this dialogue for the benefit of the early church. You ready to go down the rabbit hole? <laughs> this is the dating of the Gospel of Mark, according to most scholars, is somewhere between 60 AD and 80 AD. And this is a crazy time, what happens in this period. In 67 AD, we have Nero's persecution because in 64, 65, he burnt down huge blocks of Rome to build his lavish palaces and then blamed it on the Christians uh, and then started a, a massive empire-wide persecution. Nero, as you might know, was, na was known as the beast to the early church. They called him the beast. And Rome was essentially a one-world government because it was the ruling empire of the entire known world. And at the head of the, the world's government is a madman, unpredictable, savage madman. This guy was nuts. He was completely self-obsessed. He was very superstitious. He had omens and amulets and he had dreams and prophetic dreams and all sorts of stuff going on. And, and he was very spiritual, superstitious, crazy, self-obsessed. He put himself, he was constantly doing performances uh, and they would award him all sorts of stuff, pretending he was good. Of course, it's probably terrible. But, but he was constantly doing uh, performances in theater. He loved the accolades. He was a weird, messed up, brutal man that in his persecutions would wrap Christians in, in hard wax, stick them to torches and burn them in his garden parties. He would wrap Christians in animal skins and, and let animals uh, attack them. He would, do, he would do sadistic things for fun. He forced a teenage boy to marry him. He, he took a slave, his, his, a, a male slave of his that was another man, and he, and he had a wedding ceremony of the emperor. He had a wedding ceremony, and the ceremony he put on the dress and pretended like he was a woman. This guy was messed up. He was really, really messed up. So the beast is here, and right here in 70 AD, we have the destruction of Jerusalem. Now what's important to know is, guess who sends out Vespasian to attack Jerusalem and, and, and stop these uh, troublesome Jews that kept on trying to fight for freedom and kick the Romans out? Nero. Nero sent the legions. Nero sent Vespasian, his best dude, to Judea to put down the rebellion. The beast. 
<clears throat> and we'll get to this soon, but he sends there's, there's volunteers of the army from every part of the world. The entire world collapsed and on Jerusalem. All of Jerusalem's enemies. There were, there were volunteer contingents from Syria, which is ancient Assyria. The ancient army that once upon a time would come against Jerusalem, again, out of anti-Semitism and hatred for the Jews. They volunteer and become a part of it. There's an Egyptian legion that comes up from the south, from the north, from the south, from the east and from the west. Armies converge on Jerusalem. This is the end of the world. What's happening in this time period? 70 AD. Everything comes undone. After this point, we have the great dispersion, the Christians all around the place, the gospel going to all nations, and then we have Domitian's persecution in 80. So this is a crazy time period right now that we're looking at. A great fire Rome um, says this in Fox's Book of Martyrs. Among other diabolical whims, he ordered that the city of Rome should be set on fire, which, which order was executed by his officers, guards, and servants. While the imperial city was in flames, he went up to the tower of uh, Messina's, played upon his harp, and sung the song of the burning of Troy, and openly declared that he wished the ruin of all things before his death. Besides the noble... Uh, bes- Besides the noble pile called the circus, many other palaces and houses were consumed. Several thousands perished in the flames, were smothered in the smoke, or buried beneath the ruins. This dreadful conflagration uh, continued nine days when Nero, finding that his conduct was greatly blamed and a severe odium cast upon him, determined to lay the whole upon the Christians at once to excuse himself and to have an opportunity of glutting his sight with new cruelties. This was the occasion of the first persecution, and the barbarities ex- exercised on the Christians were such as even ex- excited the commiseration of the Romans themselves. Nero even refined upon cruelty and contrived all manner of punishments for the Christians that the most infernal imagination could design, and particularly had some skewed up, uh, sewed up in skins of wild beasts, and then worried by dogs until they expired, and others dressed in shirts made stiff with wax, fixed to axle trees, and set on fire in his gardens in order to illuminate them. The persecution is uh, general. Th- this persecution was general throughout the whole Roman Empire, but it rather increased than diminished the spirit of Christianity. In the course of it, St. Paul and St. Peter were martyred. So this is the crazy, crazy period. Um, there's also this guy worth noting, which might come up later on. We can't spend too much on him. But this guy's interesting. This is like a real false Messiah figure. This is a miracle worker that around the Roman Empire, they, he actually, it's, um, his name is Apollonius of Tyrana. He actually had a, a work written about him um, about 50 or 100 years after. Um, uh, Julius... Domnia. Um, yeah, so he was a cynic and he was a, a Greek philosopher, but he also was very spiritual and did sort of magician type miracles and things. Um, and he became the sort of antichrist figure in, in, the, in the empire. Um, and he was the, later on, they, they wrote stories about him and, and, and sent the stories around the empire as a sort of com- competitor to Jesus. And they would say, well, look at all the miracles that this guy did. And he didn't claim to be God. Anyone can do that. It was kind of like the Egyptian magicians when Moses is saying, well, God's, God's doing this. And they say, oh, we can do that. So it's, it's, it's a similar type of opposition that this guy was. Interestingly, he had a relationship with Nero. And Nero got a lot of advice from him. And so Nero not only is... A, a Nazi, Nero is evidently dabbling in occultic type spiritual practices. He was seen to go to the Oracle at Delphi. He was uh, obsessed with amulets and all these different things. So Nero was right in with these anti-Christian spiritual witchcrafty occultish stuff that was in the day. So obviously it, it went by different names, but um, this guy's interesting. Um, so back to, the, um, back to the siege of Jerusalem, just to give us a bit of a timeline. Right now we're going to zoom in on that, uh, that moment. Um, <clears throat> and we're going to look at 70 AD. So the lead up to 
to the siege was basically that Nero needed to fund more and more of his lavish, extreme, ridiculous things that he was doing. And so he started putting the tax pressure on the provinces in the empire. Judea was one of the provinces and they started to feel the burden. Um, and this exacerbated the pain and frustration of the people living under this oppression that eventually they started more and more extremists, more and more bandits, more and more zealots would rise up and do minor rebellions in the years leading up to the siege to a point where there was, there was a lot of zealots in Galilee fighting and they had a war with the Romans in, in, the, in the Galilee area around the you know Lake Galilee in that area. <coughs> so these... These guys fight and then they get defeated. And there's a whole huge, huge amount of them, thousands of these, of these guys fighting the Romans. They get defeated and they flee in the cover of night and they retreat to Jerusalem. <clears throat> so first thing that happens is the zealots in Galilee fighting the Romans flee and retreat to Jerusalem. And so what happens is in Jerusalem, bandits and thieves from all over take take over the streets of Jerusalem. Now, the way Josephus puts them is he calls them robbers and thieves. And that the reason is because a lot of the guys fighting the Romans are not the nicest people. They're, they're extremists. And what happens, according to Josephus in this time, is that in Jerusalem, it, the best way to kind of get the picture is if you lived in Palestine under the rule of Hamas. So you have an extremist group that comes in and takes over the ruling of the place you live. You sympathize with their views, but you don't necessarily agree with all their practices. You're not nearly as extreme as them. So it's kind of like this sort of situation. The zealots are extremists, and they do all sorts of things which the people living in Jerusalem actually disagree with. And so there, there becomes these uh, what Josephus talks about is these household debates where people are trying to figure out, well, do we like these guys or do we not? Do we support their effort or do we not? Do we want to rebel against Rome um, and hope for liberation and fight and believe that maybe we can fight them off and they'll never, uh, they'll never get Jerusalem because it's too strong and the walls are too thick? Or do we want to, is it futile? Do we actually just say, no, this is suicide and we, shouldn't, we should actually just negotiate with them. We should let them rule. They rule the whole world. We're not going to keep them away from Jerusalem. They rule every other big city, you know? <laughs> like, um, so it's futile. It's a waste of time. And so there's these household debates happening in Jerusalem leading up to the siege. But the zealots take over and they take it in control. <clears throat> Jerusalem becomes unsafe. Uh, and these kind of bandits live, and to, to a point where um, the temple gets taken over and corrupted. So what happens is the bandits, the, the zealots take over the temple, and they make that into a citadel. Now, for the everyday Jew, that's, that's an abomination. That's terrible. The, the temple is a place for priests and for worship and for sacrifice. It's not a military stronghold, but they turn it into one. They take over. So, so you've got the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the ruling priests are really against these zealots because these guys have just come in and taken over. <clears throat> so there are also these tens of thousands of, of mercenary zealots. These guys, uh, before then, sorry, because of the state of Judea in that time, a lot of these guys were actually bandits. So they would, out in the wilderness and the provinces, they would actually rob people. And so they were, they were bad guys. And that all moved into town and they were robbing the wealthy. They were going, breaking into houses, taking stuff. So the place was unsafe. And the citizens, as Josephus says, they were miserable. Um, so the high priest rises up, this guy, Annas, or Ananias rises up and he calls, sort of does this big speech to the citizens and he's like, we've got to get rid of these guys. Like, there's more of us than them. We've got our army contingents. They've got a few different sort of temple army. They've got their local Jerusalem militia. We can all combine together. Citizens can take up arms and we'll get rid of these zealots and then we'll go back to living in peace. The zealots are saying, no, 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 guys, your ruling parties, your Sadducees here, they're just cozying up to the Romans. They're going to sell you out to the Romans. And if you care about the temple, if you care about the liberation of our people, and, and, and you know, then you should side with us. So a civil war breaks out. 
what happens is this fighting breaks out. The zealots get pushed back into the temple and um, <coughs> they turn into their stronghold. And in the fighting, they end up setting fire to grain reserves in Jerusalem that they'll really need in a few months' time when they're under the Roman siege. So that they end up having a famine in Jerusalem because of the infighting, not because of the Romans. <clears throat> so Zealots are pushed back to the temple and they defile the temple. There's blood everywhere. There's, there's death everywhere. So the temple is defiled. So that the, the people in Jerusalem, the priests, the Pharisees, they're shocked at what's happening. This is an abomination in the temple. Okay, so this, as remember we talked about the, uh, last week or the week before, I think it was last week, chapter 12, uh, we saw Jesus... He said he was um, driving out people out of the temple and he says, you've turned it into a, a den of thieves, robbers and brigands. And we saw that one of the interpretations for, um, there's two ways to interpret what he was doing. He's either saying he was stopping people move things, which was moving blood or sacrifices around the temple. So he was stopping the temple sacrifices happen. But the word skuos had another interpretation, and the other interpretation was weapon. So he was stopping people from carrying weapons in the temple. This may be why Mark has this line, robbers and thieves, as it may actually be to do with this moment that Mark was speaking into. Mark was saying that Jesus would not have approved of this. Jesus didn't back then, and he wouldn't now. So the zealots... <coughs> Zealots get pushed back into the temple and they're outnumbered and they're outgunned. And so what they do is they send a messenger out of the city and they call for backup from the Edomites. Now, who are the Edomites? The descendant of Esau. And so the descendant of Esau, Jacob's you know, enmity between Esau and Jacob, historical enmity, they march on Jerusalem. An army of Edomites come. And the zealots sneak out at night and they unlock the gates and they get them into the city. The Edomites ransack the place, loot, do whatever they want to do, as armies do when they enter cities. And they liberate the zealots. They get the zealots out of the temple. They kill the high priest and they kill the leaders of, of the opposition. And then they take over. Um, the citizens are now fully under the control of the extremists, okay? So the city is under the control of the zealots at this point. Now, citizens are suffering under the anarchy rule of the zealots and the bandits. One last remaining Jerusalem nobleman fakes his death, jumps into a coffin and gets someone to take him out of the city. He escapes to ask for Roman help at eradicating the zealots. And this is, <laughs> this is bad. But he says, you know, okay, these guys are taken over. Can you guys come? liberate the city from the zealots. So the theory of the noblemen is that the Romans will preserve the beautiful buildings and reserve, restore order in the city. So it's interesting. Uh, obviously there's debate in whether that was the right thing to do or not. Um, but the idea that Josephus pushes, and Joseph, Josephus was quite um, sympathetic to the Romans, is that Titus and the Romans never really wanted to destroy the temple. Uh, it's just the way things escalated throughout the war that that's what happened. And, and we'll, we'll see why. It's because the zealots made that their stronghold and fought to the bitter end in the temple. And Josephus says they should have never done that. In fact, Josephus says that Titus actually asked them, put in requests for them to move their battlefield or move their stronghold to, to battle somewhere else, to fight somewhere else rather than in their temple. And they refused. So Josephus blames the zealots. The zealots blame, you know, the Romans. Everyone's blaming each other. And this is the chaotic moment that we're in. And so we're up to the seven-month siege of Jerusalem. I'm going to put this... Uh, just going to play this little video here, which will just help paint the picture. A um, little short video of, of how cataclysmic this moment is. Um, and uh, at this point, Josephus circled the walls, pleaded to surrender now and spare their own lives. 
Recalling the book of Jeremiah, Josephus proclaimed that if the defenders were in God's favor, they would have found victory without making war. Josephus made clear that Titus would show mercy if they surrendered now, and that the temple would be spared. But one defender, tired of hearing him speak, struck Josephus with a rock, knocking him unconscious. With surrender out of the question, a wall of circumvallation was built, and Jerusalem began to starve. Thousands of civilians who had not already chosen to flee the city were now caught in the Romans' net. Most were crucified, but when it was discovered that some of the citizens had swallowed their gold coins, 2,000 were disemboweled by the Syrian and Nabataean volunteers. In the chaos, the Romans steadily forced their way up the ruin, and as the priests sacrificed their last remaining lamb, the temple became a battlefield. The Romans reached the precipice of the inner course on August 28th, a day known in the Hebrew calendar as the 9th of Av. Although Titus had promised the safety and integrity of the temple to Josephus, in the heat of the battle, Titus saw such an effort as folly. And in a single moment, a lone Roman centurion pitched his torch from atop the wall into the open door of the sanctuary. day, the only living souls in the temple were Roman. The treasury had been so totally ransacked that it is said the price of gold in Syria fell 50%. Whatever few holy relics had survived the fire in the sanctuary were looted, including the great menorah. Greeted in the charred space by vast cheers of Imperator, Titus embraced his men, sacrificed a pig on the altar, and ordered the temple destroyed. At this point, John and Simon held a parley with Titus on top of Wilson's arch, with Josephus acting as translator. It seems that the Jews would have surrendered at this point, but they had sworn an oath not to, which was no small thing. Instead, they asked Titus to be allowed to flee into the wilderness. This was a no-go. Titus reiterated that the people of Jerusalem would be spared only by unconditional surrender. At this, John and Simon resigned themselves to a last stand. What took place next has been compared to the worst of modern urban warfare. While Titus organized a new siege against the Praetorium, Roman forces in the east besieged individual buildings and fought room by room through each apartment. Jewish defenders hid in basements and sewers, often looking for a way out of the city, but ultimately all were found. John and Simon were captured. They and all Jerusalemites still alive were put in chains to be paraded through the streets of Rome. This was the city of Agrippa. This was the city of Herod. This was the city of Alexandra, of the Maccabees, of Ezra and Nehemiah, of David. And on the 26th of September, 70 CE, Jerusalem was dead. So, <clears throat> thanks to this YouTube guy for providing the voiceover. <laughs> um, so, let's, let's have a look at the chapter, and then we'll dig up some more details near the end. So, we saw leading up to this chapter, Jesus rebuking the fig tree, saying, may you never bear fruit again. We saw Jesus encouraging his disciples in chapter 12 to have faith and cast down this mountain as they were looking at the Temple Mount. We saw Jesus tell a parable of the t oh, sorry, it's his talents. Um, parable of the tenants. Um, the, the the owner of the vineyard will hand it over to someone else. There's that horrible parable where he's saying that the leaders of Jerusalem have been bad tenants of God's promises, of God's gospel, and he's gonna take it off them. And hand it to someone else. So all of these judgment parables and moments leading up to this moment on the house of Israel, on Jerusalem. And now we see this big moment of judgment, the end of everything we know and the end of this age, Jesus says. So 
says this in verse 1. How about we read it through and then we'll read it uh, verse by verse. Uh, Chapter 13. And as he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what beautiful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, Do you see these great buildings? There will not be left one uh, here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? And Jesus began to say to them, See that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. These are, not, uh, these are but the beginning of the birth pains. But be on your guard, for they will, be, they will deliver you over to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake to be a witness before them. Uh, and the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. My brother will, uh, and brother will deliver brother over to death, and father is child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated for all my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be, let the reader understand. Let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down nor enter his house to take anything out. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas for the women who are pregnant, for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that it may not happen in winter, for in those days there will be such tribulation as not been from the beginning of creation that God created until now and never will be. And if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. And then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, there he is, do not believe it, for false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. But be on guard, I have told you all things beforehand. But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in heaven and the heavens will be shaken, and they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds and from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So that also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But concerning that that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, keep awake. For you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey. When he leaves home, he puts the servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake. For you do not know when the master of the house will come in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say, I say to all, stay awake. Amen. Okay, let's try and keep moving. (laughs) Okay, so Jesus sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, James and John asked him, tell us, when will these things happen? What will the sign that they are about to be fulfilled? As in the, the temple stones getting thrown down. Not one will be left onto the other. Jesus began by telling them, see to it that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name claiming that I am he and, he, and will deceive many. Uh, there was actually a zealot leader named Ben Judah who liberated Masada. He came into Jerusalem before the siege and he proclaimed himself the Messiah and he briefly took over the temple with his followers. He said, I'm the Messiah. I'm the anointed one to liberate Jerusalem. I am the Messiah. I am he. I am chosen and anointed to be your liberator. 
Jesus is saying, don't believe it. <laughs> don't believe it. Run away. <laughs> when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. These things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places as well as famines, and these are the beginning of birth pains. In this period of time, there, Rome was falling apart. So nation, it's interesting, Joel Marcus points this out, is that there's two ways of interpreting the nation rising will rise against nation in the Greek. One is two different nations, but one is actually the same nation rising against itself. The civil war, internal strife. And there was a lot of internal strife. In fact, this was the year where they, the year just before the siege was called the year of four emperors. It was the most chaotic year in the Roman Empire. There's four emperors in one year. There was lots of infighting and internal strife in this time leading up to the siege. So nation is rising up against the nation. There's infighting and conflicts and in the one world empire, uh, namely Rome. So the zealots fight Rome and Galilee. So there's wars, there's rumors of wars, there's rumors of um, legions coming. So, I mean, uh, you'd be terrified if you heard of a legion or multiple legions coming towards your city. Roman legions were the most terrifying. Uh, <laughs> it's like, it's like, it's like uh, there's, you know, America's sending three aircraft carriers to New Zealand right now, you know. <laughs> it's like terrifying, you know. Totally, exactly. It is terrifying. Moving at a phenomenal rate. That's right. Just the elite. They are the elite. Yeah. That's right. So um, the Edomites come against Jerusalem. This is Esau fighting Jacob. This is a classic prophetic moment that the Edomites come knocking. And this causes a famine in Jerusalem. There's a famine in Jerusalem. So everything's just falling apart. And before then, remember, we had Nero. We had persecution right across the empire with Nero and families betraying each other uh, toward, to, to Christianity and um, getting killed. Tactius, the Roman historian, mentions an earthquake in the city of Pompeii in 62 CE, a big earthquake in Pompeii. So there's all sorts of stuff happening in this time. Can I just make one little note here which goes back to translating the end of the world? which I think is really relevant. So it's 13.4. Although it is possible to translate this as the end of the world, the Hebraic mindset of the end of days is a transition into a new age of the Messiah's coming mm. that uh, will re uh, restore all things. Mm. Also, uh, note also that this teaching regarding the last days was not given public, but only to four disciples. <laughs> Yeah, well, interesting. interesting yeah, it? interesting. Yeah, end of the age. Or, but uh, even here, they don't even, um, doesn't even say end of the age. But when will these things happen? What will be the sign that they're about to be fulfilled? Um, but yes, the age it comes in later on, end of the age. Um, and uh, yeah, there's, a, there's a lot of interpretive discussion about what that means. Um, so Jesus says, be on your guard. You'll be delivered over to the councils, beaten in the synagogues. This is, you've got to remember, this is pre-Acts. This is pre the book of Acts that he's given these, his disciples this warning. And what do we see in the book of Acts? We see Paul uh, attesting before King Agrippa. King Agrippa, I consider myself fortunate to stand before you today as I make def my defense against all the accusations of the Jews. And especially uh, the, his brothers, yes. his brothers have turned him over. And especially, so because you are well acquainted with all the Jewish customs and controversies, therefore I, I beg you to listen to me patiently. Paul testifying before kings and councils and great leaders. And there'll be a lot of this in the book of Acts as the church is thrown into persecution, but also uh, thrown into opportunity to, to, to share before uh, great people. Verse 10, the gospel must first be proclaimed to all the nations, but when they t arrest you and hand you over, do not worry beforehand what to say. Instead, speak whatever you're given at the time, for it will not be you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Brother will betray brother. Jewish brothers, just your family, you know? So the Jews betraying Jewish believers mm -hmm. is brother betraying brother. To death, father and his child, children rise against their parents, have them put to death. You'll be hated by everyone because of my name, but the one who perseveres to the end will be saved. This is 
really important message for the early church. The one who perseveres to the end will be saved. Verse 14, so when you see the abomination of desolation standing where it, it or he, depending on the, how you translate the Greek, uh, should not be, let the reader understand, clearly written in this moment, this rendition of Jesus' prophetic words all those years before are being written to a specific audience. Let the reader understand. Early church, understand what I'm referring to right here. You're supposed to understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Why Judea? You know, if this is like all over the world, why is, why is Judea? But it's because it's, it's about something happening in Judea. Uh, let no one on the housetop go back inside to retrieve anything from his house and let no one in the field return for his cloak. Josephus describes the internal conflicts and power struggles within Jerusalem during the war with various factions vying for control. The zealots, who were radical and militant groups, sought to assert the authority in the city and the temple. They removed Ananias from his position and installed their own high priest. Phanai ben Samuel, which further contributed to the chaos and divisions in the city, says this. This is the quote. Also, they set aside the law of inheritance according to which the chief priests were uh, want to be appointed and made chief priests of whom they would. Men altogether mean and base. And for high priest, they chose one Phineas, the son of Samuel, a clownish fellow and one who knew not at all what his office, what this office of the priesthood might mean. Him they took against his will from his farm and adorned with robes as one who acts is adorned upon the stage and sought to teach him what he should do. All this was an occasion of mirth and laughter to them, but the priests, as they stood afar off, wept to see the Lord despised in this fashion. This was an abomination in the temple. An absolute abomination of the priesthood, of the high priesthood, the very temple itself is turned into a laughing stock, a citadel with a bunch of extremists carrying around weapons, disposing of priests, disposing of the high priests, polluting it with blood, stopping the sacrifice, and then just throwing in whoever they want and telling them what to do and making a joke of the place. This is an absolute abomination. How miserable those days will be for pregnant and nursing mothers. Pray that this will not occur in the winter. For those will be days of tribulation unmatched from the beginning of God's creation until now and never to be seen again. If the Lord had not cut short those days, it's interesting that he changes tense here <clears throat> to future but past. Really interesting. If the Lord had not cut short those days, nobody would be saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he has chosen, he has cut them short. On the traditional background of this woe, it is poss it's possible background in the Jewish war years. See the comment on, uh, this is a quote from Joel Marcus from the commentary, uh, 1340. Josephus tells a particularly horrible story. Oh, just censor it. I just want to, if you're listening to this, you can close your ears. It's quite hideous. If you're watching online, you get a weak stomach towards horrific stories. Just close your ears for one moment. There's a story just to paint how hideous this moment was during the siege famine got so bad people were absolutely starving to death all over the place during the siege that it was said that a, a mother roasted her infant son and and ate it and and josephus tells a story that he said when they find out what happened shock waves went throughout the whole city you know they're all just the last stand they're just trying to they're in the last moments of fighting and dying of hunger but it says shockwaves go through the whole place and it said they felt like everyone felt like they had done it this extreme guilt of what have we become and what have we done uh went through this community uh it was absolutely shocking but that's how degraded and hideous this situation was it's a, hor it's a horrible story um in in josephus's writings um and so there is this sense in josephus's account 
of just how extreme the situation was. It's not just your normal war, you know. This is an extreme moment of unbelievable suffering. And for them, for Jews, this is the day of the Lord. This is judgment day. This is the end of everything. As this Roman army is flinging these ginormous white rocks that look like huge hailstones over the wall. And it's raining down on the city. Judgment is raining down on the city. Death everywhere, blood everywhere. Josephus talks about they would, everyone was, the stench of the corpses was everywhere. Everyone would just be climbing over dead bodies. It was horrific, the siege. It was drawn out. And for them in this moment, this, this was the end. Just picturing that, this is the end. <clears throat> There is a reference to those, uh, to the danger that those fleeing eastward from Judea would be able to ford the Jordan because of the stormy weather. Uh, exactly this situation faced um, Gadarene re- uh, fugitives trying to cross the Jordan in the other direction in the spring of 68 CE. So um, basically the reference of trying to flee and how hard it would be to flee in the winter is because the Jordan floods and you can't get out of the area when the river floods. So he's saying, like, I hope, it's, hope the Jordan's not flooded because you won't even be able to get away. Um, I think it turns into a swampland, doesn't it? If you look at the Jordan, oh yeah. slower reaches, it's winding backwards and forwards. That tells you the country is extremely flat. Hmm. So when it came up, you know, it just... They would turn into swampland. Hmm. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, here is the Messiah, well, there he is, do not believe it, for false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform signs and wonders that would deceive even the elect. Um, if that were possible. So be on your guard. I have told you everything advanced. But in those days, after the tribulation... Tribulation means persecution, affliction, distress, and pressure. That's what it means. So after the persecution, after the affliction, after the distress, and after the pressure. This is a quote. If you've seen your Bible, it's formatted differently because it's a quote. The sun will be darkened. The moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky. And the powers of the heavens will be shaken. This is interesting. The powers of heavens being shaken is like principalities, powers. This is, in the ancient mindset, nations had gods and gods of different nations would be sort of fighting on their behalf. And as you see, like the Baals versus Yahweh up the mountain, you know, they're fighting and it's the, the, the one who wins, their God wins. The powers in heaven will be shaken as the wars on earth rage at the result of this calamity, there's this shakenness. Uh, at that time, they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And he will send out the angels to gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heaven. Uh, it's interesting because it's, <clears throat> I think this is an interesting interpretation moment here where at that time they, and what he's talking about is he's talking about the powers of heaven being shaken. So there actually seems to be a link here of not necessarily people seeing it, but the powers of heaven, seeing the Son of Man going out in glory, sending angels and bringing elect from the four winds of the earth to the ends of heaven. So it's almost like after this moment, after the siege, after this tribulation and distress that's about to come, that there will be uh, this sort of victory of God who goes, Jesus is actually going to go out into all, all the world and, and actually bring back the, the people into, you know, so essentially the church is going to rapidly expand. The church is, is not going to get crushed, but instead do the opposite. It's going to flourish. And that's what happens. Um. <clears throat> So we'll, we'll get back to this soon because we're going to have a look at Isaiah 30 and Isaiah 34 in a moment. 
to consider the nature of prophecy. But just before we do, this is uh, the Roman 5th, 10th, 12th, and 15th legions came uh, into the port. And then the Syrian legionnaires are from ancient Assyria. Fighters come from the Decapolis, which was the classic in the Gospels. This is the unclean Gentile area. This is where Jesus uh, goes and um, sends the legion out of the man into the pigs and they rush into the sea. This is that unclean area of the Gentiles. So they come in to fight with their hatred to the Jews. These guys hate the Jews, so they join in. They, they come in. Nabatea is Jordan. And these guys come up. Oh, the volunteers join up. And we should say that it's the Syrian and Nabataean volunteers that disembowel people for the coins. These guys, there's a lot of hatred here. Um, and there's an Egyptian legion coming up. And when you put it like this, you go, flip, the whole world is bearing down on the Jews right now, on God's people. This thing is imploding. Kind of makes you think of what's happening in the news, you know. But, but it's, it's, it's this whole region is bearing bearing down on them. There's this hatred, which maybe we could say is spiritually inspired. It's demonic hatred of, of, of these people and they're bearing down on Jerusalem. It's terrible, yeah. <laughs> okay, so we're going to just take a quick diversion and consider the nature and style of prophecy and this will make sense soon. This will help and then we'll, we'll bring it back soon. So Jews grew up listening to these scriptures at the synagogue. Okay, so against Babylon, we see Isaiah 13, which is being quoted. And against the nations, we see Isaiah 34. So we're going to read those two now. So let's turn to, if you're watching online or you uh, hear, if you've got your Bible, Isaiah chapter 13. And it's a little bit long, um, but it does help us get a feel for why Jesus, this, this prophecy that Jesus said is written the way it is. It, it's really familiar. Okay, Isaiah chapter 13. The oracle concerning Babylon, which Isaiah the son of Amos saw. On a bare hill, raise a signal, cry aloud to them, wave the hand for them to enter the gates of the nobles. I myself have commanded my cons consecrated ones and have summoned my mighty men to execute my anger, my proudly exalting ones. The sound of tumult is on the mountains as of a great multitude, the sound of an uproar of kingdoms, of nations gathering together. The Lord of hosts is mustering a host for battle, and they come from a distant land, from the end of the heavens. The Lord and the weapons of his indignation will to destroy the whole land. Wail, for the day of the Lord is near. As destruction from the Almighty, it will come. Therefore, all hands will be feeble and every human heart will melt. They will be dismayed. Pangs and agony will seize them. They will be in anguish like a woman in labor. They will look aghast at one another. Their faces will be aflame. Behold, the day of the Lord comes cruel with wrath and fierce anger to make the land a desolation, to destroy its sinners from it. For the stars of the heavens and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be dark at its rising. Interesting, hey? You've got the stars and the sun not giving light here. <clears throat> just as we see in Mark 13. And the moon will not shed its light. So there's something poetic here that's being referenced, that's being connected with Jesus here. I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will put an end to the pomp of the arrogant and lay low the pompous pride of the ruthless. I'll make people more rare than fine gold and mankind the gold of Ophir. Therefore, I will make the heavens tremble and the earth will be shaken out of its place at the wrath of the Lord of hosts in the day of his fierce anger. Like a haunted gazelle, like a sheep with none to gather them, each will turn to his own people, each will flee his own land. Whoever 
whoever is found will be thrust through. Whoever is caught will fall by the sword. Their infants will be dashed in pieces before their eyes. Their houses will be plundered and their wives ravished. Behold, I am stirring up the Medes against them, who have no regard for silver and do not, englo- do not delight in gold. Their bows will slaughter the young men, and they will have no mercy on the fruit of the womb. Their eyes will not pity children. And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, and the splendor and the pomp of the Chaldeans will be like Sodom and Gomorrah when God overthrew them. It will never be inhabited or lived in for all generations. No Arab will pitch its tent there. No shepherds will make their flocks lie down there. But wild animals will lie down there. And their houses will be full of howling creatures. Their ostriches will dwell and their wild goats will dance. Hyenas will cry in its towers and jackals at the pleasant places, palaces. Its time is close at hand and its days will not be prolonged. So this theme of um, stars and sun and yeah, horrific. It's it's very poetic. Um, it's it's showing us with these the way that it's worded how horrible it's going to be when this army comes to destroy Babylon. Um, and the sun and the stars and everything sort of going dark. That's how bad it's going to be. So. The next one to look at as an example is Isaiah 34. Isaiah chapter 34. Draw near, O nations, to hear. Give attention, O peoples. Let the earth hear and all that fills it, the world and all that comes from it. The Lord is enraged enraged against all the nations and furious against all their hosts. He has devoted them to destruction. He has given them over for slaughter. Their slain shall be cast out. The stench of their corpses shall rise. The mountains shall flow with their blood. All the host of heaven shall rot away and the skies roll up like a scroll. <laughs> the host of heaven is the, um, is the stars. The skies roll up like a scroll. This is obviously poetic, um, but it's making a point, making a powerful point. All their hosts shall fall as the leaves from the vine, like leaves falling from the fig tree. So the host of heaven and the stars in ancient writings are often linked to gods and angels, luminaries of heaven, as Enoch puts it. So, so there is a crossover between uh, this idea of when you look up, you see the heavens and you see the stars and you see the glory. And, and there's this sort of crossover idea between stars and angels and gods. Um, and so I think this is a connection where we see prophecy against nations, against great cities and then we see the host of heaven and and we see the powers the heavenly powers sort of feeling the impact of that because the idea is that the powers are the ones in control of these great cities and great nations the powers and the gods of the nations and so that's actually a war in the heavenlies that's happening uh in the ancient mindset oh um I'll leave it there of that one, <laughs> just because for time. Um, <clears throat> so we, we, we keep mushing on. Now, this is, this is really, really important here. Um, Tisha B'Av, the ninth day of the month of Av, August 12 to 13, 24 is this year, is the saddest day on the Jewish color on which we fast. This is from a Jewish learning website. And these guys are rabbis and they write about to, to Jewish people how to do it. What's crazy about this is for them, on this day of fasting, f- because of what happened on this day, there's a comment down the bottom and this Jewish guy was saying to this rabbi, hey, uh, my kid's got a birthday on this day. What do I do? And he said, this is not a day for birthdays. You should be putting it off to a different day. So this is, this is the day of the wailing wall. This is the day they all go to the wailing wall and they wail. Is that this is a day of fasting and sorry. Okay, so this is this day. What happens in Tisha B'Av? In 1313 BCE, the spies returned from the promised land with frightening reports and the Israelites balked at the prospect of entering the land. God decreed that they would therefore wander in the desert for 40 years. <sighs> Judgment. Sorrow. Weeping. Both holy temples in Jerusalem were destroyed on this date. <laughs> you get that? On the same day. 
the Romans burned the temple on the same day that the Babylonians burned the temple all those years before. <laughs> I mean, if that doesn't catch you, like, what will? This is crazy. And Jesus, was, Jesus like, knew exactly what he was prophesying about. This is a real event that that generation would experience. Everything was about to collapse in front of their eyes. The heavens would quake at the destruction and suffering that they would experience. He is preparing them for unspeakable suffering. He's like, guys, this is going to be horrible what you're going to experience. The whole world is going to beat down on Jerusalem and we're going to see judgment like you've never experienced before. The first temple was burned by the Babylonians in 423 BC and the second temple fell to the Romans in 69 AD or CE, unleashing a period of suffering from which our nation has fully never recovered, says the rabbi. The Bar Kochba revolt against the Romans this, um, in 133 CE ended in defeat. The Jews of Batar were butchered on the 9th of Av and the Temple Mount was plowed one year later on the same date. Later in our history, many more tragedies happened on this day, including the 1290 expulsion of England's Jews and the 1492 banishment of all Jews from Spain. This is like a really intense day for the Jewish people. Really significant. It's a cataclysmic event. Okay, so there are actually some really interesting examples of prophecy that happened really close to the temple's destruction. So Joel Marcus puts this here in the commentary. He says, rabbinic traditions, for example, record prophecies and portents of the temple's destruction 40 years before its demise, that is, in the time of Jesus. So potentially, they're, they're not sure about this, but there is prophecies that they've found in the rabbinic sources that echo what Jesus was saying around the same time. What's interesting is 40 years, Passover to Passover, that this happened. Jesus, 40 years is a generation in biblical. This is such a symbolic, powerful number. Jesus gets up there and he stands on the Mount of Olives. And what's also interesting is when Titus appeared with his armies, it says that he, he's in one spot and then he moves around. There was a little raiding party came out. The Jews come out and raid a little bunch of them. And so he goes, okay, well, I'm going to go station up. And where does he stand? But he, bu he builds a little station with one, of, one or two of his legions up on the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives facing the temple. The same place that Jesus stood and prophesied its destruction. It's the same place that Je Zechariah chapter 14 says that the Lord will stand on the Mount of Olives in the day of the Lord. And it would be split in half. <clears throat> so we're going to read this. Example from Josephus, the war, book six, chapter five, notes, signs, and warnings. Um, we've got this here. <clears throat> it's a little bit long, but it's so worth it. It's absolutely fascinating. So let's go. Hopefully we don't run out of time. A false prophet was the occasion of these people's destructions who made a public proclamation in the city that very day that God commanded them to get up upon the temple and that they should receive miraculous signs of their deliverance. Now there was then a great number of false prophets suborned by the tyrants to impose on the people who denounced this to them that they should wait for the deliverance from God and this was in order to keep them from deserting and that they might be um, buoyed up above fear and care by such hopes. Now a man that is an adversary does easily comply with such promises. For, for when such a seducer makes him believe that he shall be delivered from those miseries which oppose him, then it is that, he, he, that the patient is full of hopes of such as deliverance. This is Josephus, by the way. <clears throat> Thus, sorry, I just need some help with this. Thus were the miserable people persuaded by these deceivers and su as such as be bellied God himself, while they did not attend nor give credit to the signs that were so evident and did so plainly foretell their future desolation. But like men infatuated without either eyes to see or minds to consider, 
did not regard the denunciations that God made to them. Thus there was a star resembling a sword which stood over the city, and a comet that continued a whole year. Thus also before the Jews' rebellion, and before the, those commotions which preceded the war, when the people were come in great clouds to the Feast of Unleavened Bread on the eighth day of the month of Xanthicus, <laughs> uh, at the ninth hour of the night, so great a light shone around the altar and the holy house that it appeared to be bright daytime, which light lasted for half an hour. This light seemed to be a good sign to the unskillful, but was so interpreted by the sacred scribes as to pretend those events that fo um, followed immediately upon it. At the same festival, also a he uh, an heifer, as she was led by the high priest to be sacrificed, brought forth a lamb in the midst of the temple. Moreover, the eastern gate of the inner court of the temple, which was of brass and vastly heavy, and had been with difficulty shut by twenty men and rested upon a basis armed with iron, and had bolts fastened very deep in firm, into the firm door, which was there made of one entire stone, was seen to be opened of its own accord about the sixth hour of the night. Now those that kept watch in the temple came to hear upon running to the captain of the temple and told him of it, who then came up to the end, not without great difficulty, was able to shut the gate again. This also appeared to the vulgar to be a very happy prodigy, as if God did here thereby open them to the gate of happiness. But the men of learning understood it, that the security of their holy house was dissolved of its own accord and that the gate was open for the advantage of their enemies. So these publicly declared that the signal foreshowed the des desolation that was coming upon them. Besides these, a few days after the feast, on the one and twentieth day of the month, Artemisius, Tisius, <coughs> a certain prodigious and incredible phenomenon appeared. I suppose the account of which it would seem to be a fable were it not related by those who saw it and were not the events uh, and were not the events that followed it of so considerable a nature that as to deserve such signals. For before sunsetting, chariots and troops of soldiers in their armor were seen running among the clouds and surrounding of cities. Moreover, at that feast, which we call Pentecost, as the priests were going by night into the inner court of the temple, as their custom was to perform their sacred ministrations, they said that in the first place they felt a quaking and heard a great noise. And after that, they heard a sound as of a multitude <clears throat> saying, let us remove hence. But what is still more terrible, there was one Jesus, the son of Aeneas, a plebeian and a husbandman, who, four years before the war began, at a time when the city was in very great peace and prosperity, came to that feast whereon it is our custom for everyone to make tabernacles to God in the temple, began on a sudden to cry aloud, a voice from the east, a voice from the west, a voice from the four winds, a voice against Jerusalem and the holy house, a voice against the bridegrooms and the brides, and a voice against this whole people. This was his cry, and he went about by day and by night in all the lanes of the city. However, certain of the most eminent among the populace had great indignation of this dire cry of his and took up the man and gave him a great number of severe stripes. Yet did not he either say anything for himself or any uh, peculiar or anything peculiar to those that chastise him, but still went on with the same words which he cried before. Hereupon our rulers, supposing, as the case proved to be, that this was some sort of divine fury in the man, brought him to the Roman pure crater, where he was whipped till his bones were laid bare. Yet he did not make any supplication for himself, nor shed any tears, but turning his voice to the most lamentable tone possible, at every stroke of the whip, his answer was, Woe, woe to Jerusalem! And when Albinius... For he was then our procurator, asked him who he was and whence he came and why he uttered such words. He made no manner of reply 
to what he said, but still did not leave off his melancholy ditty till Abenius took him to be a madman and dismissed him. Now, during all the time that passed before the war began, this man did not go near any of the citizens, nor was seen by them while he did so, or while he said so. But every day uttered these lamentable words, as if it were his premeditated vow, Woe, woe to Jerusalem! Nor did he give ill words to any of those that beat him every day, nor good words to those that gave him food. But this was his reply to all men, Indeed, no other than a melancholy presage of what was to come. This cry of his was the loudest at all the fe- at the festivals, and he continued this ditty for seven years Whoa. and five months without growing hoarse with, or with being tired therewith. Until the very time that he saw his presage and earnest fulfilled in our siege when it ceased, For he was going round upon the wall, he cried out with his utmost force, Woe to the city again, and to the people, and to the holy house. And just as he added at the last, Woe, woe to myself also. And there came a stone out of one of the engines, and smote him, and killed him immediately. Those are huge big rocks that were thrown by the, um, oh, what's the word? Yeah, the catapult thing. They call them, Josephus calls them engines. (laughs) And killed him immediately. And he was uttering the very same presages he gave up the ghost. Now, if anyone consider these things, he will find that God takes care of mankind and by all ways possible for shoes to our race what it is for their preservation. But that men perish by those miseries which they madly and voluntarily bring upon themselves. This is interesting, Josephus. This is the way he's interpreting these events for the jews by demolishing the tower of antonia had made their temple four square while at the same time they had written in their sacred oracles that then should be then should their city be taken as well as their holy house when once their temple should become four square but now what did the most what did the most elevate them in undertaking this war was an ambiguous or ambiguous oracle that was also found in their sacred writings about uh, how about that one time from their country should become governor of the habitable, habitable earth. The Jews took this prediction to belong to themselves in particular, and many of the wise men thereby deceived their determination. Now this oracle certainly denoted the government of Vespasian, who was appointed emperor in Judea. However, it is not possible for men to avoid fate, although they see it beforehand. But these men interpreted some of these signals to make their own pleasure. <clears throat> Madness was demonstrated. Interesting, hey? So that's Josephus and his uh, thing. And there's just a couple more interesting things. I'll we'll try and wrap up any moment. Jesus said this um, towards the end. Now I learned the lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its branches become tender and sprout leaves, you know that summer is near. It's interesting that he's referencing the fig tree again because he did that earlier when he, he was denouncing the, the leadership. <laughs> so also when you see these things happening, know that he is near, right at the door. Who is he? It's interesting. Um, I think we assume that it's talking about Jesus, but it might actually not be talking about Jesus. It might be talking about the one who's bringing judgment. Um, <clears throat> we know that he is near, right at the door. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away this generation will not pass away until all these things have happened. If it wasn't happening in that generation, then Jesus was a false prophet. Jesus says this generation will not pass away until all these things happen. All these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. No one knows about the day or the hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, only the Father. Be on your guard and stay alert, for you do not know when the appointed time will come. It is like a man going on a journey, left his house, put each servant in charge of his own task, and instructed them, the doorkeeper, to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know when the master of the house will return, whether in the evening or at midnight, when your rooster crows, or in the morning. Otherwise, he may arrive without notice and find you sleeping. 
Interesting that he references the rooster crowing and he references finding them sleeping. It's just like the story of being in the garden where it, yeah, anyway. Um, And what I say to you, I say to everyone, keep watch. Just another interesting thing. The Jews in the history books, uh, the Christians left the city. The Christians left the city. They weren't there in the siege because the Christians were forewarned by Jesus. And there's also some of the Christian historians have recorded other accounts and other prophecies about fleeing the city. The early church believed that Jesus was talking about this event. And that's why they left. They left to an area called Pella up here. Eusebius, uh, one of the famous church historians, says this, The people of the church in Jerusalem were commanded by an oracle given by revelation before the war to those in the city who were worthy of it to depart and dwell in one of the cities of Perea, which they called Pella. To it, those who believed on Christ traveled from Jerusalem, so that when holy men had altogether deserted the royal capital of the Jews and the whole land of Judea. They took Jesus' words and they said, this is what he said would happen. We're going to flee Judea. Um, Epiphanius on Weights and Measures, a Roman historian, says this. So Aquila, while he was in Jerusalem, also saw the disciples of the disciples of the apostles flourishing in the faith and working great signs, healings, and other miracles, for they were such as had come back from the city of Pala to Jerusalem and were living there and teaching. So this is when they'd come back from that place after the siege when they'd returned. So they left, and they lived in a different place for a while, and then they returned. <clears throat> for when the city was about to be taken and destroyed by the Romans, it was revealed in advance to all the disciples by an angel of God that they should re- remove from the city as it was going to be completely destroyed. They sojourned as immigrants in Pala, the city above mentioned in Transjordania, and this city is said to be of the Decapolis. Fascinating, eh? <clears throat> so it's a tiny little map there put onto Google Maps, but that's kind of where it is. Jerusalem's there. Pella's up there. Um, there's like Nazareth and there's Sea of Galilee, so it's not actually too far. Um, <clears throat> uh, we just read that. Oh yeah, I want to I want to just read this. Sorry, five almost at the end. You good? All right. <clears throat> this is right at the end of the war. Just to paint the picture a little bit more. Now, when Titus was coming to this upper city, this is sorry, Josephus of the war, book six, chapter nine. Now, when Titus was coming to this upper city, he admired not only some other places of strength in it but particularly those strong towers which the tyrants and their mad conduct had relinquished. She's talking about the zealots. For when, they, when he saw their solid al- um, altitude and the largeness of their several stones and the exactness of their joints and how great was their breadth and how extensive their length, he expressed himself after the manner following, we have certainly had God and for our assistant in this war, And it was no other than God who ejected the Jews out of these fortifications. For what could the hands hands of men or any machines do towards overthrowing these towers? At which time he had many such discourses to his friends. He also let such go free as had been bound by the tyrants, the zealots, and were left in the prisons. To, uh, b- because what happened is the zealots were now occupying, they got a whole bunch of the aristocracy, a whole bunch of the leaders of the city, and they just threw them into prison. <clears throat> uh, so um, Titus let them go free. Uh, to conclude, when he entirely demolished the rest of the city and overthrew its walls, he left these towers as a monument to his good fortune, which he had proved his auxiliaries and enabled him to take what he could not otherwise have been taken by him. And now since his soldiers were already quite tired with killing men, and yet there were, appeared to be a vast multitude still remaining alive, Caesar gave orders that they should kill none but those that were in arms 
and opposed to them, but should take the rest alive. But all, together with those whom they had orders to slay, they slew the aged and the infirm. But for those that were in their flourishing age and who might be useful to them, they drove them together into the temple, shut them up within the walls of the court of the woman, over which Caesar set one of his freedmen, as also Fronto, one of his own friends, which last was to determine everyone's fate according to his merits. So this Fronto slew all those who had been seditious. So if they sided with the zealots, they got killed and robbers and who were impeached by one, by one another. So people told on each other and they got killed. Brothers betrayed brothers. But of the young men he chose out of the tallest and the most beautiful and reserved them for the triumph. So they would march them back to Rome and march them through the imperial city and show how great Titus was and here's the Jews that we conquered. <clears throat> and for the rest of the multitude that were above 17 years old, he put them into bonds and sent them to, Egypt, to the Egyptian mines. Titus also sent a great number to the provinces as a present to them that they might be destroyed up upon their theatres. So I sent them to the gladiator theatres to get killed by the sword and by wild beasts. But those that were under 17, 17 years of age were sold to slaves. And we can see in Rome, the, uh, the Arch of Titus right beside the Colosseum. Um, and inside the panel just here, I think, um, is this little um, carving here. You can see the menorah. This is them sacking the temple and taking everything back to Rome. This is the last last little spell. Josephus, Book of the War, Book 6, Chapter 10. And thus was Jerusalem taken. In the second year of the reign of Vespasian, on the eighth day of the month, Gorpius, uh, AD 70, for it had been taken five times before, though this was the second time of its desolation. For Shishak, the king of Egypt, and after him, Antiochus and after him Pompey and after them Sosius and Herod took the city but still preserved it. But before all these the king of Babylon conquered it and made it desolate 1468 years and six months after it was built. But he who first built it was a potent man among the Canaanites and is in our own tongue called Melchizedek the righteous king for such he really was on which account he was there the first priest of God and first built a temple there and called the city Jerusalem. Really interesting. This is what Josephus yeah. thinks, which was formerly called Salem. However, David, the king of the Jews, ejected the Canaanites and settled his own people therein. It was demolished entirely by the Babylonians 477 years and six months after him. And from King David, who was the first of the Jews, who reigned there to this destruction under Titus, were 1,179 years from its first building to its last destruction were 2,177 years. Yet hath not its great antiquity, nor its vast riches, nor the diffusion or glory of its nation over all the habitable earth, nor its greatness of the veneration paid to it on a religious account been sufficient to preserve it from being destroyed. And thus ended the siege of Jerusalem. Jesus, Mark 13. He knows what's coming. He's standing there talking to his disciples. He's going, guys, in 40 years, the world's going to turn upside down. Your lifetime is going to be chaotic. You're going to see things and experience things that you would never possibly imagine. This is going to be the end of everything you know. You've grown up with the holy city. You've grown up with Jewish law. You've grown up with Torah study. You've grown up with bringing your sacrifices here, coming here for the feasts. Everything's about to turn upside down. This world's about to go to carnage. You're going to have massive persecutions when Nero comes. You're going to have brother turn against brother. And this holy city, the city of God, is going to be utterly destroyed. This great empire this, that rules the world is going to descend on Jerusalem from all sides. It's going to encompass Jerusalem. The beast will send his armies and they will utterly destroy the city and the temple. They'll burn it to the ground. <laughs> and they, these guys have just struggled to comprehend it, you know. It's just, it's, it's too big. 
it's too big to comprehend. And so he uses this prophetic language like we saw in Isaiah. The stars and the powers in the heaven are going to quake. The stars are going to go dark. It's going to be unbelievably ca- catastrophic what's going to happen. So this is Mark 13. This is, uh, this is what we're talking about. It's a bit depressing in a way because I think... Um, <laughs> you Sorry? It's pretty chilling. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's pretty horrific. Yeah. It's absolutely fascinating. I'd, I'd encourage you, if you do have time, to read the works of Josephus. It's fascinating. It's chilling. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll pray to close. Um, is Jesus going to return one day and make all things right? Absolutely. We, we, we've got that in the creed that was written hundreds of years later. That the church agreed this is foundational truth. They believe Jesus will return and make all things new. That the Bible begins with Eden and it finishes with Eden. It finishes with this perfect place of God's presence with man making all things right. So one day there's this hope beyond this tribulation, beyond this moment, beyond this destruction, that one day God's going to return and make all things right. But right now in this moment, this is like, this is a doomsday prophecy. This is depressing. This is horrible. But thank God the Christians were warned and they were grateful. They were grateful because they got out of there. Well, because under the new covenant, we live in heaven. <laughs> you know, because, mm. um, because in Christ, we are a new creation. So it's heaven here on earth. Yes. And he wants despite to come and his kingdom come. Despite what, what is happening around. Yeah. yeah, and with the destruction of the city, with the destruction of the temple, it was like God was like, I'm doing a new thing on the earth. And it's not going to be confined to this. It's not going to be limited to this. It's not going to be exclusive. In fact, it's going to go out. It's going to take over the whole earth. My gospel, my kingdom, my dominion is going to reign throughout every city, not just this one city. It's going to go out and it's going to be way bigger than you guys can see right now. And can imagine, this thing is way bigger. Hard to get their heads around. It would have just rocked them. And, and they only would have looked back, I think, when they're living in power and they're, they're hearing about Jerusalem being destroyed and they're weeping. They would have been incredibly gutted. But they would have looked back and gone, man, he warned us. He told us this is all going to happen and we, we're grateful. So... God, we thank you that you warn us about stuff and you speak to us and you, you care. You care enough for your people and you cry out from the streets. You cry out that judgment's coming. You cry out that there, there is a, a sin leads to death, that you cry out that there's consequences and that you want to save us from those things, God. You call us all to repentance and you call us in to be rescued. You want to rescue every single one of us. And so it's sobering, um, it's scary, uh, but Lord, we just pray that we would all be people that listen to the voice of the Spirit crying out. We would be people that, that listen and, and hearken to your word and, and respond in obedience and faith. And when you cry out from the streets, when you cry out to our hearts, that we would be people that align ourselves with you and go where you lead us into safety. You lead all of us into safety away from chaos. And we pray that anyone watching this recording uh, anyone here, anyone watching live, would be receiving your call tonight and feeling your call. And whatever chaos is in our lives that we're facing, whatever areas of sin or destruction that we're toying with and we're flirting with, we wouldn't be so arrogant as to ignore your warnings. We wouldn't be arrogant to ignore your call. But we would follow your warnings. We would follow your voice. And we would walk away from the sin and destruction uh, and pride. And we would we would find ourselves following you as you rescue us from, from sin that leads to death. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thanks, everyone. Thank